Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and value partners, thank you so much for joining us live here at the Next Generation Talent Innovations uh, in Workforce Skills Development Webinar brought to you by Workman. My name is Mihai Noj. I'm the partner and head of Congress here at the HR Congress, um, head of content at the HR Congress. Before we start the session, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Workman for making it possible to run this very interesting and very timely session for you. And if you haven't got a copy yet, I strongly urge you and recommend you to grab a copy of Making Work Human, uh, authored by uh, Eric Mosley and Derek Irvine, the CEO and Senior Vice President of Work Human, because this is an amazing book, help you to keep your employees engaged, creative, innovative, and productive, simply work human. Uh, very insightful, uh, full of great ideas, and I'm sure it will help you to continue a successful journey on creating people centric and people people focused enterprises. But today here we are here to explore urgent trends and transformative strategies shaping workforce skills mapping, development and talent management. And I'd like to encourage all of you to join us in a conversation a chat box, say hello to where you where you came from, what's your goals and what's your objectives? Why are you joining uh, here for this session? Also if you have any questions just put in a Q&A and time permitting we shall either answer the question during the the course of this uh, forum or after the event, we shall channel the questions uh, to the speakers and we shall reach out to you uh, after the event. But now without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome and introduce our host for today's session, Joseph Moscadini. Joe is the Enterprise Account Executive at Workhuman and he will be leading the discussion. So Joe, thank you so much for hearing with, being here with us today. The virtual stage is all yours. Yeah, my pleasure uh, to be here, Mahali, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are really delighted to have you with us here today. Um, and today, as you know, we're going to be tackling this topic of skills, um, a topic that is both wide and deep um, as we look to the future of work and what that means for talent today, um, but probably more importantly, tomorrow. Um, and I think at this point, we've all heard a lot um, maybe we're tired of hearing about the skills economy and how organizations need to be shifting towards a skill-based organization of work rather than one that is role-based. Um, but this concept and how it's applied varies enormously from one company to the next um, based upon industry, culture, organization of work, the nature of work that is performed in the organization and so on. Um, but one thing is, is certain, I think, that mapping the skills required for the future will remain an important topic um, and more importantly, creating an environment in terms of systems, technology, culture, leadership, and so on, that can actually foster um, those skills is critical. Um, so we have three sessions for you today, each going to be about 30 minutes long. Um, first of all, we're going to be joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Lynette silver -Helen. So Lynette is the consulting practice lead um, in EMEA here at WorkHuman, where she partners with our clients on change strategies to help make work more human um, empowering millions of employees to feel noticed, valued, and appreciated um, for who they are and what they do. Um, in the last presentation, she's going to talk about the role of strategic recognition in the skills revolution um, and hopefully give you a bit, a bit of flavor around some of the research we've done on how recognition can empower people, transform cultures um, with a specific focus on uh, learning and skills. Um, after that, we'll be joined by our friends from Nokia, um, David Schantz, who is the global head of workforce analytics, um, as well as his colleague, Andrea, who is the global head of HR for the cloud and network services business. And they're going to talk to us about how they're reimagining the future of work and skills at Nokia, which should be fascinating. Our final session is going to be a panel, uh, which I'm going to be moderating on cultivating a culture of recognition and continuous learning. Um, so during that, we're going to be discussing the opportunity recognition presents to cultivate not only a practice, but also a culture of learning in an organization. And for that, I'm privileged to be joined by Jasmine Keel, who is the global head of learning and leadership development at Sonova, um, Ingo Delman, who is the head of L&D at Olympus, as well as my colleague, David Burke, who is the senior director of global talent acquisition and employer branding here at WorkHuman. So as Mihaly uh, explained, the chat will be open if you have questions, and hopefully we'll have time for a few at the end of each of the speaker sessions. Um, and we'll also have a few polls over the next 90 minutes, so look out for those um, so that you can contribute and look out for the reading material that will be available to download as well. So speaking of which, um, we have our first poll before Lynette uh, gets started, and we're going to start with a very simple one. So 
Do you believe that there is a skills gap at your organization today and specifically a skills gap that is stopping your business from reaching its full potential? So is there a business implication for that skills gap? Yes or no? So let's leave it open for a couple more seconds and then let's see the results. Can we see the uh, can we see the results as they're coming in? So yes, eighty seven percent of you um, say that there is a skills gap that specifically is inhibiting uh, business outcomes. So not not surprising, I think. And you know, clearly, it's a bit of a loaded question. If you're here, you probably believe um, that's true. So there's a clear consensus that this is a challenge, um, and it's what I see too in the work that I do with our customers. Um, and my observation is that most organizations start with a similar mindset here, um, but also run into similar challenges. And hope so, hopefully some of these will address today. But I think for most organizations, the first step is to establish um, a skills taxonomy and build that into a talent marketplace or something similar. So there's a common language and mechanism for matching skills to work. Um, and whilst that's a great start, I think it does fall short in that whilst it's great knowing what you have, um, you first need to consider what you will need. Um, so whilst understanding current state is good, there's maybe a more fundamental question to be asked around the future of work and which skills will actually be required that that needs uh, addressing before we begin that measurement exercise. Um, and maybe moreover, whilst cataloging skills is important and measuring the gap is important, measuring the gap does not in and of itself catalyze the development and the progress that's going to be needed to close that gap. So maybe we need to think about that in parallel with the measurement exercise and even with respect to measurement, I think there's a real question around data too um, and quality of data. If we're relying on self-reported data or even manager and leader reported data, is that reliable? I think that's an open question. Um, are, we, are we getting the right answers and an accurate vision of current state so that we know where we need to go? Um, and I think Lynette is gonna touch on some of the more innovative ways that organizations are crowdsourcing insight into that question in a more sophisticated way. So, uh, with that, let's kick off with our first keynote. So I'm going to hand over to Lynette, um, who will present her keynote on the role of strategic recognition in the skills revolution. So over to you, Lynette. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm thrilled to be part of this session today and, and learn from everyone on the skills, the skills gap, the skills economy, where we are all going with this. Uh, we're hearing across our customers, across the industry, those we speak with at our conferences, uh, the, the, the skill gap and the skills crisis is real. Uh, skills are changing incredibly fast. Employers can't keep up. Employees don't know what the new skills are gonna be. Everyone is worried about how they are going to be effective in what's going on and what's coming. Uh, McKinsey did a global survey. 87% of companies worldwide reported experiencing skills gap. So this group, dead on target for the skills gap in our organizations. You're in good company globally as we're all working to figure this out together. In fact, um, nearly all respondents to this survey identified closing the skills gap as a main concern, yet only one third have any kind of preparation plan idea in place on how they're going to do it. And only 28% say their organizations make effective dec decisions around the skills gap today. So we have quite a bit of work to do. And yet there's so much opportunity here, um, so much reason to be excited with this. Uh, McKinsey uh, associate quoted in the research, we're, we're rapidly moving from a job-based to a skills-based economy, requiring more nimble, tech-savvy, multiple di multidisciplinary teams. This can be a scary statement to some, nimble, tech-savvy, multidisciplinary. Well, I'm, I'm not all that nimble, I'm not all that tech, and I've only got one discipline I really know anything about. 
Brene Brown spoke at our Working Women Live conference in Austin, and, and she's looking to the future of what the future of work will need in terms of employees and types of people in it. We don't need knowers anymore. We do not need people who know everything about their discipline. We need learners. We need curious people. We need those, in her words, who can see the movie through to the end those who are nimble, tech savvy, multiple disciplinary and interested in learning. And then while we're going through this skills gap, the skills shortages in these new emerging areas, I, I feel like it's required, I need to say AI, um, are driving up talent competition and who's going to be on board to support us in this. So when we look at the skills economy and what we're moving into as an organization, uh, quite a few factors within the economy around um, the need to, for that broad range of skills, both hard and soft, technical and human. It's uh, a significant change in how we hire, how we train, how we look for the people who are going to take us through this. The importance of human skills rapidly rising in our hybrid and dispersed world, prioritizing upskilling and reskilling because we can't hire external for all of these needs, uh, encouraging skills mapping to, to just understand what do we have today? What are those strengths and gaps? And then building that roadmap forward. What I'm most excited about in the skills economy though, is how it is leveling the playing field when we do this right. Because the upskilling and reskilling opportunity means training, education, learning through the work in the workplace. And that opens up a lot of new possibilities for underserved workers who have not had the opportunity for expensive university educations, training courses, etc. We are leveling the playing field in a new way. Uh, also from the McKinsey study, uh, on this point of the upskilling and reskilling in non-degree skill building programs, how critical that is to attracting and retraining talent while they're also driving our market competitiveness. The more we take on what some see as the burden of upskilling and reskilling, the more we are holding on to our culture, building a culture that people are interested in staying with, where people are more engaged and productive because they know our commitment to them, our commitment to their growth, their opportunity in the organization. But similarly, we have to be very clear. You know, hard skills can be taught, automated, assisted. Soft skills are more challenging. So as we're going through these skills gap analyses, thinking about upskilling, reskilling, learning, how we're, how we're hiring where we need to. How are we identifying beyond those hard skills? And I wanna change our language around this. It's not hard skills and soft skills. It's technical skills and human skills. And LinkedIn research is showing here on screen, most in-demand skills in 2024. And there are some of those technical skills here around project management, research, uh, analytics, but even those have a very strong undercurrent of human skills. Analytics is not just a process of running uh, an R study of, of the data. It is understanding the story behind the data. What is the story that data is revealing to us? And that takes those human skills so when we think about skills and skills gap in our organization and what we're doing to map skills and understand skills, many organizations, I'm sure yourselves, are doing um, a call for skills, building databases of skills and organizations. And yet, if, if I could see a show of hands, I'd ask for it. How many of those efforts are self-reported? We're asking employees, Record what you feel you are strong in. What are your skills? What are you certified to do? What have you received some kind of external acknowledgement that you are skilled in this area? 
project management. You're a certified Asana project manager, Java coder, grade three welder, process engineer. These are things that are often appearing in the skills reporting that we're gathering today. What we're not gathering is communication skills, leadership skills, or the top skill of the moment, adaptability. I can self-report that I am adaptable and that is a skill of mine, but I'm not certified in adaptability. How are we quantifying that? And that's what I'm going to show you in just a minute, how we can begin to quantify those human skills. And this is critical to do because identifying those human skills within our teams is a vital step in talent development. And this is how the role of strategic recognition comes into the picture on informing our skills analyses on these human skills. So this is the work human IQ skills analysis that is served up within our strategic recognition programs. It's working off of an AI tool that we have built to identify those human skills and then read the recognition messages that colleagues are sharing with each other to understand how colleagues are identifying the skills in others. According to this chart, this team, this person is high in adaptability, less so in problem solving and collaboration. This is not self-reported. This is as being identified by the team. So what does that look like? And how can we appropriately use AI as a multiplying tool to humans to understand this? In the work human application, you wanna see a skills chart for the last three months among your team. The AI will look at those recognition messages being gathered, reveal them. What, what we wanna know more about leadership in that. Why is leadership the skill being most identified? Or what trends are we seeing in DEI? And how are people using the inclusion advisor tool to be sure that they're not, um, uh, to, to uncover the unconscious bias that might be in their own messages. All of this becomes available to us when we are encouraging recognition and appreciation at scale among colleagues, between colleagues uh, to reinforce the behaviors we want to see and then surface up skills in this way. So, so diving more into this role of strategic recognition in the skills economy, got research we did with Gallup and a global survey around what recognition is and how it is most effective for employees. Uh, Gallup has found recognition is the most have impact when employees receive recognition that is fulfilling authentic, embedded in the culture, individualized, equitable. It's hard to separate these out. What these mean in aggregate is the recognition people are receiving is not good job. It is not, thanks, bro, love you. It is when you joined in our meeting and brought your insights and brought your, your knowledge of the work being done and were open, which is a core value of ours in the organization, when you were open and shared those insights, we all learned from that and helped us get to a final decision faster. Thank you. We share meaningful, authentic recognition in this way that is individualized to the person. We are learning so much more about each other and about where we're moving together as an organization. So what, what's the ROI of getting to recognition at scale, getting to frequent recognition? Gallup research found in, in an average organization, if we could simply double the recognition of being achieved, we can double the numbers. But when people agree that they're being receiving recognition or praise for doing good work in the past seven days, they can see 9% improvement in productivity. 22% decrease in safety incidents and decrease in absenteeism. As you can see on the right, that translates to quite strong financials as well. Simply by telling people 
that thing you did, that contribution you made, it made a difference. You made a difference. Keep doing that. Do more of that. We appreciate that. We value that in this organization. And when we get to that point, we recognition drives much more engaged work groups. And we see amongst organizations that we work with, in the top 25%, the top quartile of those who engage in recognition activities, there's 20% more sales, much higher productivity, customer satisfaction, ultimately profitability, versus those in the bottom quartile of engaging in appreciative cultures in this way. Much higher absenteeism, safety incidents, quality defects, turnover, et cetera. And so what we are talking about at its core with strategic recognition is building culture, building the culture in your organization through moments that matter, where people feel noticed and valued for their work. And that lets us take recognition from a practice to a way of life. So how does that connect to skills? When we nurture and reinforce desired behaviors across the organization, we see more of what we want in an ongoing way. We're cultivating that environment that supports and celebrates learning and development in a continuous way, and also dramatically increases psychological safety. When people are recognized and appreciated, appreciated specifically for contributions, for how they delivered, as well as what they delivered, the outcomes. People feel much more safe in the organization to continue to share, to continue to learn, to continue to fail. We need people in the skills economy to be comfortable failing, learning quickly and moving forward. Because that's how we will all learn and move forward together in an organization. And oh, by the way, when we do this well, People are far more likely to be engaged at work, recommend the organization, less likely to leave. That bottom right stat, far more, far less likely to feel burnt out at work, often or always. This drives to our employees' well-being as well. So what can we learn about these human skills through recognition activity? What we see across 70 million data points 9 million unique English award messages that we evaluated through our Work Human IQ team. The top skills being recognized, efficiency, proactivity, supportiveness, collaboration, leadership. How would you identify this in your organization today? How would you understand trends in your organization around supportiveness? What method would you use to uncover that? In strategic recognition at scale, we're encouraging everyone to recognize and celebrate those. We're demonstrating the core values, the key behaviors that we want to see repeated again and again. We're able to understand in a different way, skills that matter, those human skills. And we can even understand this by industry. We do see dramatic differences by industry on what is most valued interpersonally based on recognition messages. Within healthcare, not surprising, patient, help. Within finance, skill, client. Within government organizations, effort, contribution. Within tech, dedication, play. Tech, play. I love this one because we need an element of play in our work when we're developing new technologies, new systems, trying to figure out this AI beast, because that is how we learn. And again, that psychological safe environment to do it in. We also can see what the top trends are uh, and how recognition messages about AI has increased significantly, especially in tech, finance, and biotech. I don't think anyone's surprised about that. As, our, as organizations are engaging more and more in uncovering AI, well-being has also increased significantly. I am so proud of organizations around the world 
especially in healthcare and government, but across industries, being very clear about how we care for each other. This is vitally important when we're going through upheaval uh, with AI, with skills, with uh, so much in our world today. Okay, let's bring this down to, yeah, I get it. That's wonderful across industries, aggregate data. What can I do in my own organization? What can I understand within my own company? Let me share uh, a two or three slides here of what one customer of WorkHuman learned through skills analysis in their organization, looking at those human skills as revealed through recognition at scale coming from colleagues. Uh, right off the top, finds those hidden gems. So bottom axis, the X axis, we're seeing the amount of recognition received. On the Y axis on the left, we're seeing people's human skills scores. And it's those in the upper left box that are scoring very highly on skills, but not getting a lot of recognition. This is, is a proxy for potential. Those who are not highly recognized, but highly skilled. And these are the people that we need to be especially looking to, investing in, making sure they feel recognized, appreciated, valued. Because what they are able to do, what they are capable of bringing, not just to the organization, but to their peers and colleagues around them, is significant. Okay, let's look at leaders. So here's that soft skills map again. In this organization, they wanted to understand leadership and how their role modeling changes they want to see across seniority levels. And what they are seeing as seniority level increases, supportiveness and efficiency decreases, but communication grows. This is what you would want to see. Lower level manager, closer to working with groups of people in teams, we need them to be supportive. We need them to be efficient. But as that managerial level rises, the opportunity to do that decreases, but the importance of transparent communication rises exponentially. And we can see that playing out in the data. Or what about at occupational levels? When we look at occupations and amongst process engineers, we see that in if you just do an analysis of uh, what process engineer job descriptions say, the across job descriptions, leadership 28%, critical thinking 28%, collaboration 28%, supportiveness 14%, Leadership, critical, think, critical thinking, collaboration, supportiveness, highly desired skills that our talent acquisition teams are, are saying, this is what we are looking for, what we are seeking to hire. We see amongst the process engineers that we have on board today, we have potential hidden strengths in proactivity and efficiency, but we've got gaps in leadership. And that's quite valuable information for our talent acquisition, L&D, talent management leaders and teams to understand as they're going to hire process engineers. We have a gap in leadership. Let's prioritize looking for that. So we can tell you real information about what those human skills are we need. And then we need to be very consistent in promoting people with those right human skills as well as those technical skills because that makes for happier teams. Uh, when we do this, when we're offering skills-based training and education based on the gaps that we understand we have, we can increase employee productivity, create that sense of purpose. Uh, Eric Mosley, my CEO in the book, Making Work Human, that Molly shared at the start of this session, he defines recognition and appreciation this way. He says, purpose is collective. 
Meaning is personal. Recognition, appreciation is the bridge in between. By that he means, you know, the purpose of the organization where we're all working to achieve together, it's collective, but how I derive personal meaning to what I do every day on delivering that purpose, how I make that connection comes from the recognition I receive from others. And when I understand how what I do every day, how I'm spending my time, does anyone care? Does this have value? When I know that is true, burnout, turnover reduces and we begin to bridge the skills gap. And of course, we can avoid the cost of hiring externally for each new role and skill as it comes up when we can understand more clearly. And uh, we can amplify the benefits of upskilling when we're creating more opportunity for people in our organizations to grow, change, move jobs even internally. We're building our culture. We're creating opportunity. We're showing people they have a path to grow. And again, that we are invested in them as people, increasing engagement, reducing burnout. Okay, so practically, I'm, I'm guessing if you're joining us today, you're on board with this. <laughs> you're deeply invested in closing the skills gap in your own organization. What can we actually do? Well, uh, I, I think I'm up to saying AI six times now. So I'm getting to the quota required in any presentation today. Uh, but this is the wrong equation. It is not people plus AI. It is people times AI. It is that multiplying effect of what AI and te technical tools can do to support our people, to support us as we're seeking to learn, understand, move more quickly in this world. The first step is admitting that gap even exists. And thankfully, 87% of this call acknowledging the skill gap exists in your organization, we're there. But we have to acknowledge that lack of readiness. We have to admit that, you know, we don't really understand where those gaps are in our organization. And we have an idea of what we may want to do to bridge it, but we're not really sure. We're not quite sure how we're going to tackle that. We need to be willing to invest in the skills auditing, mapping, incentivization to help our people move into the skills areas where we need them now and then be flexible, adaptable to where we may need them to be in a month's time, six months, a year, two years, five years, so that we can begin to equip for the future and build for that future plan. And then we need, of course, to structure for success. So we need to make sure our skills program is aligning with the executive vision. If we are simply collecting skills data, building skills databases, and that information is not mineable, is not usable, is not influential in a way that aligns with where our executive and strategic plans are going, why are we bothering? And then we need to gain managerial support to action what we learn, what we understand about the skills gaps in our teams, and that we cannot simply externally hire to fill every single one of them, we need to be looking into our teams, into our people, and how we can upskill and reskill. And even then, we need to make sure those reskilling efforts are not isolated, but they're integrated into that overall strategy. We're not uh, doing buzzword bingo over identifying the skills that we're training into. And then we need to Im embed reskilling and upskilling behaviors with strategic recognition. Because remember, Recognition at its core is a behavior amplifier and encourager. It communicates what we value and what we need to see more of. As such, that helps foster a culture of continuous learning and again, create that psychologically safe environment. 
also helps align employee development with business goals. When we're using the recognition messages from others to help inform where our skills gaps lie. And then using that data for strategic workforce planning. Where can we move people around internally to support needs as well as hiring? Of course, we can't forget to future-proof. So we gotta watch out for the pitfalls that we know are there, time, budget, psych safety. Are we setting aside the time, the people, the money that we need to be sure that we are tackling this fully, but in a way that doesn't scare people, that doesn't have people worrying that because they aren't the next AI tech expert today, their job is going to be outsourced, moved, or shut down. Now, it is very much a balance of where do we go to get help? with this um, in-house support learning around this gives you control and customization partnerships externally gives you that external expertise for most organizations it is a balance of that some will weight more heavily than others on either one but that balance of in-house knowledge of your own culture and external partnership for uh, opportunities that we are sometimes blinded to when we're focused internally. And of course, balancing reskilling those we have and then hiring externally where we just can't get there fast enough through reskilling efforts. And then of course, reap that return on investment. All of this we need, we need to prove we're driving to the value we want to see. Uh, and that comes from data driven employee skills or informed decision-making. The more we learn about what kind of human and technical skills we have in-house, we can make much more informed talent management, workforce planning, skills alignment, decisions aligned with our business objectives. And of course, that helps us preserve our corporate culture, give our people a sense of self as well as safety for continuity, engagement, and alignment with board goals. And as we say at Work Human, without the human, it's just work. That's now more than ever. We need to keep the human at the center of what we do. Thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us today. Great. Thank you so much, much Lynette. Um, great insights. And um, for the audience, uh, you can download um, some of the data and the research that Lynette shared um, in the report that will be available uh, that we co-authored with Gallup. Um, so look out for that. Um, I think we need to move on pretty quickly um, to give the Nokia folks the opportunity to share their story as well. So let's dive um, straight into that. So over to you, um, David and Andrea. Looking forward to hearing about the Nokia story. All right. Can you hear us? At least me? <laughs> yes, I'm here too, David. <laughs> Hi. Good. All right. Let me... Welcome, everyone. Let me just uh, make sure I can share my screen here. Okay, can you see this? Yes, I can. Good. Let I me go into present. All I right, let me go into presentation mode. So yeah, following up on on that presentation with Lynette and, and Work Human, I must say at Nokia we are a, a big Work Human uh, customer and a big fan recognition. But she's hit on a few things that will segue into the the presentation with it with Andy and I. Um, because we are actually doing this in practice as well. And we'll as uh, you know, we've worked together a while. Andy will introduce herself. I've been in, in I am David. I'm based in Munich. Um, I've been here for the past 15 years or so. Um, I am American, so my English is still pretty good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, and I come from a long background in HR roles, uh, both in the U.S. and, and across the, uh, the globe. But 
Um, I, uh, formerly, I came into the analytics role about six years ago to bring analytics into HR. And I came from a role of multiple years of seven years or so in the role that Andy is in as a head of HR or a strategic partner for, for many business units, which gave me some unique insights. And I was asked to take this over. And I am a data fan and I come from the client side. So I kind of knew it was necessary. So built the team from scratch and we've really had a great ride. I've never looked back. Um, and we continue to partner now with business leaders like Andy and in, in the HR function and others. Um, and we will like, if we were together, we'd be like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire <laughs> live dancing across the stage. But we hope to dazzle you with uh, some of the things that we're doing in our in our use case. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> thanks, David, for the extensive, <laughs> you know, introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Ilish. I'm uh, located in Hungary. Um, I'm working as the global HR head for CNSPNE. And actually, we started to work with David together for well, five years because I joined Nokia five years ago in the HR operations arena, both of us being data and also employee experience fans. So our collaboration continues. And, uh, and this is something which we would like to, you know, give you a snapshot of today in this presentation. So Very I'll good. over to you, David. Yeah. Let me just share a bit about Nokia for those that might not be so familiar. Uh, there's just a, a, a key few highlights here. One is we're quite big. Um, number two is we're 150 years old. Not not everyone in the workforce is that old, but you know, <laughs> but we are very very diverse. Over 130 countries. And the final thing is we don't make cell phones. I know a lot of people when I'm live at a conference, I'll ask how many know that that is that Nokia does not make cell phones, and there's still a number of hands that that kind of go up. Um, we are a technology data software infrastructure business um, through multiple business channels and bringing you 5G, 6G. So all of your network traffic, all of your innovations in signaling traffic, all of these things are, are coming from us. Um, but the manufacture of cell phones or design is, is a thing of the past, but hopefully you enjoyed your time with Nokia phones and, and you can still get them through, through uh, other channels, right? Um, so with that being said, um, as I mentioned, I, I'm heading up the Workforce Analytics and Insights uh, team for Nokia. And we got to you know, start back in 2018 after a very, very big acquisition of Alcatel Lucent, which added uh, 50,000 employees to us, doubled our size, finally got some unified data. And, and I started looking at how we could move this forward and started with data visualization of our products, which is very valuable for those of you that are that are doing this and found out that Nokia, we were a big Power BI user as well. We are a big Microsoft stack shop uh, for multiple business purposes and, um, and started visualizing. And this really was a big wow factor because we haven't had it before and, and really started driving the uh, traction and appetite as you see here. 2020 and 2021 COVID, claim to fame, we were able to spin up a lot of things. Everything you'll see here, we do in-house um, with a with a quite light team, but a very, very capable team and spun up lots of different things to help navigate through the pandemic, through dashboards, tying together lots of different data sources um, that we could, and then focus really on our use cases and, and bringing our stakeholders along. Um, we, we can spin up shiny new things much more quickly than the the users can digest them. And we we did that and we had to pivot and step back and bring our stakeholders with us and then really focused on data literacy campaigns and and specific programs for HR and data literacy, multi-module programs, et cetera. Then you see here really accelerating the value with the greater democratization. We started uh, building our HR data platform enhancements using ML and AI personalization and recommendations, we'll get into this in, in there. And then now using large language models and other technological advancements, as Lynette was mentioning, the, the data and the technology to use it for good for the employee development and the business views um, becomes um, spectacular in the value proposition. So over the time uh, in the journey, we, we have developed a lot of different domain analytics products, portfolios, and, and services to support the business and employees. 
you can just see them here. I mean, lots of different things that are extremely robust for analysts to really look at what's going on historically, the current situation of the workforce across multiple lenses and metrics, um, and what, what's likely to happen in the forecasting side. And then, of course, you see we have very, very rely, reliable and reliant on um, analytics in the town attraction. Um, we hire about 8,000 people a year. This is used heavily and relied on heavily. All of our learning consumption and what is happening where in the businesses, employee health and safety on critical incidents and things we've taken over. And of course, employee experience, which is a lot of sentiment analysis surveys and other things that we're adding in, in in these domains. And we came up last summer with this convenient app store to access this and also manage, manage who gets access to what. Um, but a lot of this started out with the business needs, right? What, what is happening with the workforce? Where are we going? How do we, you know, the strategic workforce planning element, the, you know, where are things going wrong? Where, what are the views segmented down to the building level? I can tell you the attrition of a female cloud engineer at a building in Chennai at any point in time. And that's how detailed it's gotten for, for this analysis. And as mentioned, about 50, about 45% of our population of that 85,000 is in R&D or product management. We are not much in manufacturing. We are a knowledge-based company and a technical-based company. But we really started to focus uh, more on the employee versus the business focus in, with these various elements, right? Really, let's focus on employee experience, professional growth, career development, ability, and skills to see how our analytics can help support our customers, the business, the HR partners working to drive initiatives across this. And with that came a new strategy, which and Andy will tell you about now. Yeah, thank you. So a few years ago, um, when right after Pekal and Mark uh, and our new CPO started, we really started to look at, you know, so far we were servicing the business, we were really doing a lot for the business. But we wanted to make sure that we are putting far more emphasis on supporting the employees. So we said that we really need to renew our approach to people. We need to create more opportunities for them to develop a career at Nokia. Because we have a huge workforce and lots of opportunities at the companies. So increased talent mobility is really, you know, something which is which is going to be extremely useful both for the company and also for the employees. So we created the new people strategy, and our main promise there is to shift the shift the focus from supporting to the business, the business to supporting the individual growth. You know, as I mentioned, enhancing the talent mobility ensure long-term sustainability, upskilling the people, focus on growth, development. And, uh, and this people strategy actually uh, at the beginning has been co-created with all of our employees. So we did hear the employees' voice. We were listening to what they were really you know, wanting to, to get out of the people strategy. And uh, we were building on their, on their inputs. So one important pillar of this aspect is the growing together um, and uh, because we are trying to enrich, recognize and reward individual experience and skills, matching personal, professional and also business growth. Um, can you please go next, David? <laughs> yes, this is the analytics support that we decided how can we help in this journey. Yes, thank you. Um, but let's look at how we are. We decided to put this into practice with the help of the or analytics team. And can we go to the next slide, please? Sure. So this is my growth portal for myself. This is my actually uh, welcome screen, because my growth portal is really the proof of concept uh, which we launched last year. This is a front end portal and has got very different modules. Uh, what we can see actually that it is having a great adoption rate uh, already after one year of being introduced. We did spend some time on it because, you know, as David mentioned, sometimes because we are so good on the data front, we are very, very quick in delivering solutions. 
but we also need to make sure that we are familiarizing it with the employees and we are making the employees to understand how useful it is for their careers. And the more and more we are fine tuning, everyone's starting to understand that how useful and how important uh, this portal is for us uh, as, a, you know, uh, as the hub for all of the information. This is a robust personalized recommendation engine, actually. And what we can see already after one year, maybe not only to this, but also thanks to this one, we have a lower attrition and it is really helping to reskill our employees and also to you know, increase our internal talent mobility. But how does it work? So only employees can access their own data. It's automated and updated daily, and it helps employees to develop their skills and also to manage their careers. This is an in-house built solution, by the way, so we are not purchasing it from anywhere, but this is something which we uh, decided to build for on our own benefits. Um, we have a huge job portal. So it's also this internal job market you also see on the screen. But, you know, employees can be lost sometimes if they are not searching directly um, to, to some of the jobs, then, uh, then, then they can be not be aware of uh, opportunities. What we did, we actually are pushing this information to the employees now. They only need to spend a little time on fine tuning their skills profile in the MyGrowth portal, putting down their interest of where they would like to you know, grow and develop. And then in the background, so as I mentioned, the MyGrowth portal is the front end. So in the background, these are the different data sources where this MyGrowth portal is taking the information from. All right, yeah. So as I mentioned, only the employees can access their own data. So the line managers are really not looking at it and, and it is very safe therefore, and it was very easy to deploy uh, therefore, because you know, in Europe uh, and those other parts of the world, we are very, very much aware of the uh, data protection rights and the importance of that. But because it is so safe for the employees and the employees are actually also putting in the, the, the content themselves, Therefore, it's an, an extremely, you know, um, useful and easy to use portal, which, uh, which contains all of the data here. And it is pushing emails on a regular basis and news on a regular basis based on the employee's interest. It is also uh, pushing information on future development and training opportunities based on the interest or based on the profile of the employees depending you know which area or where the person would like to develop further um yeah david back to you all right so as andy mentioned right there, there's a lot of use of the data that's really based on our, our previous uh, and our current competency framework row profiles all the jobs you've ever applied to all the jobs you've ever held all the training you've had and scraping the common denominator competencies across those to build a profile, as well as the same scraping going on in all of our job openings and all of our learning programs, which is a massive library um, um, across what are the priority competencies or skills these programs are designed to address and making the matching. And as you can imagine, it's, it's, a, it's a massive amount of data. But one of the things that we decided to move again to the next level of granularity, and this really gets into the skills um, evolution uh, for more granularity and focus for the same concept, right? But as you see here on the study, right, we, we also believed this, so we needed to find a way how can we get more information on the skills of our employees with the re restrictions we have on assessment and, and other things in Europe and, 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 um, and the other, where can we move forward? So that's a good starting point as similar, you know, similar to LinkedIn, actually, we built this portal in-house in our cornerstone uh, learning management system. Employees can go in and self-nominate their own skills. They will have some um, reference on drop-down from their profiles that they can validate or select from to, to assist in that. 
but we don't know what skills they may have acquired, both hard and soft skills, or what we call human skills, which are equally important in this technical world um, from other companies, from, from not uh, promoting them themselves. Uh, and now this gives them the opportunity to do this, and it's a very great starting point. So we're trying to drive attraction to this. <clears throat> they can pull from a skills competency library. This is very large, and this is where some of the, the, the activity that we'll share in just a minute is, is making sense of all that using machine learning and, and large language models to make it relevant on the skills and taxonomy that are particularly needed for us in Nokia, right? So there's massive amounts of data skills databases in all of our client systems, Oracle, SAP, Cornerstone, government sources, and we need to focus this what's market relevant for us and for our needs. <clears throat> the next thing, of course, is linking that to our people manager portal, which is also uh, shows multiple dimensions of a, of a workforce updated daily to a manager. And they can now see the inputs. This is a multi rater system where employees can opt to have their managers rate on their selected proficiencies against their ratings or peers. And it comes in an easily digestible format for line managers to see next level on their teams or two levels down on an aggregated basis or individual basis uh, with similar to, to the radar chart that when it was showing, right? In some of these, they've already taken actions in the business units. Uh, Andy also works with defining what are, the, what are the requirements for these competencies for the roles that we're really trying to develop that become critical for us. And you can map it against the required uh, proficiency levels but you can see here all the information that's available at the click of a button to, to the managers, which is really becoming useful and, and for two pieces. One is looking at proficiency levels to focus on where development needs to sort of happen or be promoted. The second is the interest of skills wanting to be developed by the employees. Managers can now look at this and it becomes increasingly important for the development discussions on, on the skills they're most interested in progressing in uh, on a priority basis from their own personal perspective. So you see here all the different um, reporting options, views and things that you can do, but it's really uh, uh, quite impressive that managers can now look at this from the portal input to the output side. Yeah. This That was last year. And all of this moved at, at light speed. I mean, to my, my peers, when I speak at conferences and things are a bit jaw dropped um, from that, my growth portal was a concept in November of 2022 and launched in July of 2023. Um, and then we're continuing to refine this. So we're building the new skills taxonomy. This is a long journey. Any of you entering into the skills transformation know that's the long haul. What is a taxonomy that makes sense? So this, I love the phrase from an article called, you know, in, in skills transformation called, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it? How do you make this most useful where you're not de just deconstructing a competency framework at detailed levels and then rolling those back up to skill groupings that become competencies that become roles again? So, this takes a lot of work and a lot of inputs to develop the taxonomy at a degree level that granularity level that makes sense to maintain, that can define the market uh, segmentations that you're looking for, internal movements, et cetera. So these, this, we started focusing now on critical skills to Nokia, and they have these various elements to it. Um, and it, uh, again, if those of you embarking on this, if you ask 50 people, 50 leaders, what they are, you get 50 different answers. So there's really a project team behind this that launched that's really making headway in this. Um, and they have their, the main pillars of this you see here, sort of the foundations, right? Creating and maintaining the skills profiles on the critical skills. Uh, these, these are very select and they're business specific, but they're also very strategic for us in artificial intelligence and or cybersecurity and or different things as a company. And then we're working on ways to look at scenarios for gaps um, and, and assessment, and then creating learning solutions through multiple um, opportunities, formal learning, rotations, and other things that, that Andy will talk in a minute. And then wait, how do we measure success in finding ways, the KPIs, to make sure we're pushing in the right direction 
which we can easily now start um, tracking, if you will. I want to show you just a couple things before I turn back over to Andy. And these are these are quite cool because it's the use of advanced technology to help build the profile using data and, and technology um, elements. One of the things that we wanted to look at are adjacent skills. And these are a proximity of closeness of skills from one to another, which is used really as a good inference for upskilling and reskilling. This person has a long, a long way away from these skills and these skills that this person has is very close. We can just easily start promoting these adaptability and came up with a way to uh, visualize this as well. Uh, and this is a technical uh, algorithm that's looking at cosine distances and different things. I can't explain it. I don't know how they do it, but, but they're pretty amazing as, as a proof of concept to start looking at this. The second piece of this is how do we get more information about skills of employees through passive, active and passive data? Um, and this is skills inference, right? How do we infer what employees, they tell us they have these, but can we infer scraping data from self ratings, manager ratings, education experience, things we have on employee data that gives us an inference um, to skills and capabilities and competencies that they have from these elements of behaviors and other indicators. We've got all of your learning and development HUD information. Then there are a lot of other sources, right? Certifications, um, sharing sessions where they are presenting on certain topics, collaboration where they're talking about specifically their expertise in certain areas. And even in job applications and for example, CVs. Now this is where we, we just recently took a step back here because we have an ethical and AI use charter. And it, just as a word of caution, when you start looking at some of these sources to start taking information from them, employee applies to a job with their CV. We know what the job requirements are and that's public, right? But we don't know really what the CV contains and the employee is submitting this application with a CV. Now, they specifically agree that you can use the CV, but not for skills scraping or other intended uses. So. This is where you really need the employee buy-in to make sure there's transparency. Hey, if you sign up to this, like with the skills portal, they sign up to that, that their managers can see this. It's all voluntary. But just as a word of caution, just because we can doesn't mean we always should. And we're very aware of that. So we said, hey, wait a minute. But, but the concept is the same. This is our jet, uh, a big Azure HR data platform. And we can start inferring skills that they can say, hey, this really helps embellish my profile. I agree with it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an interesting ride with the technology and, and the skills profile building, which for sure will feed into the next parts of this journey. Yeah, and uh, thank you, David. So let's look at how to put things in motion. I mean, this is kind of one of the the, the, the first step after uh, Migrant Portal has been introduced. And we are experimenting with it uh, for a few weeks now, only a few weeks now. But I'm very excited because I'm a big believer in job rotations. But we all know that it is sometimes really difficult to put into practice because the managers doesn't really want to let the previous employee go or they are really relying on their skills. So we were thinking about how to make it easier uh, for employees you know, to access uh, opportunities. So these geeks, which we are introducing are risk-free, as David said, test drives for employees. <laughs> so we are letting employees to experiment uh, and we are letting managers to uh, experiment as well. So this is a skill-based approach and leader, the, the leader's role is really sh gonna shift from managing the employees to orchestrating work through projects and tasks in the future. So it is a really, really good landscape now to, to give it a try, test it, share skills and talents across functions without really committing long-term both from the managers and also from the employees. And if you, if you have a think about, so gigs are just a, a short-term project where employees can sign up for 
they spend a few hours a week with line manager consent. They spend a few hours a week with a different unit, different department. Um, they are utilizing their skills. They are developing new skills through these assignments as well. And, um, and it is all very flexible and, and easily, easily manageable, I would say. Gigs are available, same via the My Growth Portal, as well as job opportunities. And, you know, the, the notification comes based on your skills. These are the gigs which might be interesting for you. And it's really, you know, easy for, for people to, to just press the button and apply for that. Yeah, here's if a you, real life yeah. example. Sorry, Andy, I was just going to mention your, your yeah. example, right? And, I mean, Andy's such a big, big fan of, of gigs, I think. Her new title is she may move into being a gigolo. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so if we also think about, you know, project work and being involved in other units projects has really been kept for high potentials because this was the way we were developing high potentials uh, further, you know, making sure that they are invited into different projects all over the place. Now with these gigs, it is open for everyone. And it is really, you know, helping or promise to, to upskill the people and also helping talent mobility. Recently, I had a career discussion with someone who said that, you know, she's extremely good in uh, her role, but she doesn't see herself, you know, growing further in that. So I said, why don't you try to, but, but she doesn't know yet where to go. Why don't you try to experience with gigs? You're going to meet new departments, you're going to meet new skills, you might realize how it is working with, with others, you build your network across the company. So it has got a lot of, lot of benefits and you figure out uh, on the way without really, you know, committing long term into something. So she got really excited. I think we all need to do the selling at the company from now on, because as I mentioned, it's fairly new. But this is, uh, you know, this is something which is which is going to, uh, in our view, um, level up or skill development. So um, we are really relying uh, on on our, you know, future skill based approach, and uh, we will, you know, developing it further. We are extremely committed to it. This is really just the start of our journey. Uh, how to foster collaboration and how to, you know, become more of a, a, a skill-focused uh, employer. Um, that our journey is going to continue. So stay tuned. Thanks, Andy. With that, I think um, <clears throat> appreciate all of you uh, attending. Hopefully, you got some interesting inspiration or insights um, from us, and we're happy to connect with you on LinkedIn or other. Other things for questions, uh, we don't unfortunately have too much time because uh, we have the show must continue for questions and answers, but we're free to take them offline or you have a, a, a copy of the presentation in PDF version anyway, um, after the event. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, Andy. That was fascinating. Um, really great to hear about the practical things you're doing at Nokia. And I think it forms great connective tissue between some of the ideas that um, Lynette was sharing and some of the real life practices that are going on in a large organization such as yours. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so we should move on pretty quickly, I think, into the uh, final panel discussion because we're a little bit over time. Um, so we have about 20 minutes left. Um, so yeah, allow me to introduce um, Ingo, Jasmine, and David, who will be joining me for this. Um, and, you know, I think just to kind of set up the conversation, the, the subject is cultivating a culture of recognition and continuous learning. And I think for me, you know, the significant idea behind that title is, is the fact that as you consider the skills gap that most organizations have, it's, it's not only so large, but also is such a fast moving target that it is probably not something that we can address with, um, you know, a specific learning intervention um, or, or anything of that nature. It really has to be a cultural change, right? It has to be an appetite and an energy for development and learning in the organization um, that empowers and drives employees to keep up and develop and, and really evolve on their own terms to, to close that gap. 
Um, and I think that's where recognition comes in because ultimately recognition is the cultural energizer that can fuel um, that change that we need to see. So um, with, with that context out of the way, I'd, I'd love to ask the panel to introduce themselves and maybe just share along with the basic information, um, what recognition really means for you and why you feel, if, if you do indeed feel that it's important to um, cultivating this culture of continuous learning and continuous development. So maybe we could start with you, Ingo. You're first on the left on my screen. So yeah, sure, pleasure. So thanks, Joe, for the for the invitation as well. So my name is Ingo Delman. I'm head of learning and development at Olympus in the Europe, Middle East, Africa region. So Olympus, maybe some of you know this company um, because they've undergone a medical procedure. It's a Japan-based company. It's a global medtech company, and heavily involved in providing services for. Um, early detection, diagnosis, and treatment, of course, along different medical procedures. Um, learning and development in our company, at least in EMEA, it's not an HR function, so I'm directly located in the business. Um, of course, there, um, there's, a, there's a training component to HR as well. Um, so that's to myself when talking about recognition and, and the culture of continuous learning, Joe. Um, so for me, and we've heard a lot about um, recognition also already from Lynette and from the Nokia case. For me, it's really about very broadly speaking, acknowledging the uh, and valuing the efforts and the accomplishments of, of our employees. And it can take many different forms, right? I mean, there are monetary, there are non-monetary um, recognition measures, public or privately. I mean, we can come up with learning hero awards, um, but very privately recognition can also be a, dedicated, very specific, valuable feedback that I would give as a manager. I think at the very end, it's important that on the, on the one hand side, it fits to the company culture or the other way around that you um, specifically take decisions to change or initiate a cultural change um, within your company through recognition measures. Um, and I think, Lynette, you, you also mentioned or, or made clear the relation to certain certain KPIs and the return on um, return on invest. Um, when we talk about recognition and the culture of learning, for me, it's clear that it is recognition is a motivation boost. It is a it is a positive reinforcement, and therefore we can also easily draw conclusions, obviously, to growth mindset, so a term that we are all familiar with, or even harder KPIs, so to say, when we look at employee retention and others, as Lynette has pointed out very clearly before. And... Great, super interesting. Thank you. Um, over to you, David. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, David, I um, head up the Global Talent Acquisition and Employer Brand here at uh, WorkHuman. I think when we think about recognition and the role that it plays in as a cultural enhancer, I think like from an employee perspective, it shows that we care, you know, that their development is important to us. Um, and then by promoting and celebrating that, we're just boosting that culture, um, you know, of continuous learning, of operational excellence, um, you know, and evolving as a business. I think recognition plays really important role in supporting and developing those cultures. Um, informal, uh, light touch recognition has a part to play when we look at strategic programs, formal recognition programs. You know, it it uh, it just drives um, you know visibility, engagement, um, and participation. And then I think also crucially when we have recognition at scale. We get a really interesting data set, you know, on our human intelligence. That's a really, really strong, um, you know, companion piece to some of the stuff that David and Andrea demonstrated in the work they're doing in Nokia. So I think all of the stuff I and Ingo has covered off in a few in terms of positive reinforcement, building a learning mindset, really deep and increased employee engagement um, by both, uh, you know, delivering more personalized um, training programs, but also fostering a sense of achievement and a culture of recognizing those achievements. And then, of course, um, you know, recognition um, when done strategically across the organization also promotes this uh, really valuable and oftentimes uh, overlooked peer to peer element. So promoting peer learning and it's not just this top down model. And um, so I think, you know, there's there's many, many ways that that recognition can boost and support and supercharge, you know, our, our L and D outputs. Thanks, David. And over to you, Jasmine. Yeah. Hi, everyone. 
fantastic to be with all of you today. My name is Jasmine Keel. I am the Global Head of Learning and Leadership Development at Sonova. Sonova is a global leader of uh, innovative, innovative hearing care solutions, so think uh, hearing aids, but also cochlear implants, etc. Well, and so I sit uh, in the Global Talent Center of Expertise, and we look after 18,000 employees in 100 locations. And you, you question, Joseph, really made me curious. So it's been since Monday, I'm thinking of uh, recognition and learning. So why do I get up in the morning with the team? We have two key objectives in global L&D. It is to really build, to build a learning ecosystem with all the offerings, the webinars, the workshops, the programs, the 10, 20, 70, but it's also to strengthen the learning, the learning culture. And when you think of learning culture, we did an in-depth assessment at Sonova about where is our learning culture. Uh, and it's a lot about being clear about the learning promise, how much time people can spend really learning. That's the in integrated part of work that we have the C-level sponsorship, uh, but it also very much ties to recognition. So a little story. We had last year the recognition week across Sonova with all our employees. And we asked them, what makes you feel recognized? And I was like super curious, what are they going to put there? The number one topic was give me feedback and give me learning and growth opportunities. So as part of strengthening the learning culture, we really, really, really want to also promote this feedback culture providing opportunities so that people um, see that it's for the organization's benefit, but it's also for, for them to feel like they contribute and they progress. So that's a long, long, long answer, but I love the connection be between recognition and learning culture. I think it's no, yeah, I love that answer. innovative. Mm -hmm. I love that answer because it, it speaks not only to recognition as a way of incentivizing the behaviors that we want to see, but also as learning as the recognition itself right the the development opportunities as as the reward um so fascinating um perspective so you know first question you know i i love this idea that you know keeping up with the pace of change and and the pace of change in the skills gap specifically ha has to be a cultural change right it can't just be a moment in time intervention it has to be um a change that sort of captures the organization and and is owned by everyone on a cultural level um, I'd love to pass this to you, David. You know, can you can you share a bit of perspective on how, you know, you see recognition as as that energizer, as that signal to behavioral change in an organization? Yeah, I think um, again, you know, it, it kind of the recurring themes when you go last on a panel, it kind of the easy answer is what everyone else has said, right? So we've had some really interesting themes just weave through. But I think it's all about just that, you know, behavior change and, and kind of, you know, um, delivering things that feel personalized and and um, tailored to the individual. But actually, by doing that, what we're doing is highlighting more strategic skills development. So the organization can deliver on one hand something that's deeply personal um, and targeted from an individual perspective. But in doing so in a programmatic and thoughtful way, we can really drive and shape not only the culture and embracing, you know, uh, a willingness to learn and continuously involve, but also make sure we're nudging people in the direction that we need to go from a strategic skills development and, and acquisition perspective. And, re you know, recognition programs can, can help support those organizational goals by highlighting and rewarding, as we've seen. And um, but I think it's just that, you know, uh, a, a little nudge towards more goal oriented learning as well. Um, so we can deliver personalized content, but we can make sure that it's stuff that's really going to enhance and support the employee experience and, and their development related to, to where the organization needs to go culturally in a practical way. So, um, you know, I think there is a, you know, a strong behavior and culture shift, but it's very pragmatic, can be very pragmatic and targeted from a business perspective as well. And it's trying to find that alignment between, you know, changing the behaviors and the mindset delivering personalized um you know and rewarding experiences for people through technology and you know very intentional programs but then also really kind of delivering value to the business as we look to shape and evolve 
and, and, and look into a, a pretty unknown future in, in, in terms of what the business is going to need in a, a three and five year window. I mean, in the past, we were able to be pretty confident in terms of what that next phase of skills acquisition would would involve. You know, but just uh, things are changing so fast and, and having a, a more uh, intentional and programmatic approach um, that has the employee at the center of it, but also very targeted to business objectives. I think that's, you know, that's that's the challenge that we're all facing into. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And I have a question um, for you, Jasmine, actually, but, you know, feel free to ignore the question and piggyback off what David said, because, um, you know, I think there's so much to unpack there. But, you know, when we spoke, um, you shared a lot about the kind of foundations that you had set within the organization that will enable ultimately a learning culture to thrive. And I think that's so important to be thinking about those um, foundational elements. So we'd love to hear a bit more about some of the work that you've been doing in that area. But again, feel free to, to share more on that kind of behavioral piece as well. So um, before I mention, like, it, it's interesting because uh, I, I talk a lot to many learning peers and I think all our slides start to look very, very similar. <laughs> so there's always one slide about, you know, building the learning infrastructure ecosystem and strengthening the learning culture. That's, and uh, the next slide is always about how do you make it a win-win situation where this learning culture is built around fulfilling the business needs building the skills needed today and tomorrow, but also meeting employees' expectations and their desires. And I think that's what you were saying, right? So you want the sweet spot in the in the middle. And so what we've been uh, doing to guide this learning culture uh, towards uh, what's in this sweet, sweet, uh, sweet spot has been to, uh, to put a, a leadership framework in uh, in place and you can uh, you can see 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 it and let me just talk a little bit about about it so i've been in learning leadership development for for 15 years and i i think there's a lot of things i don't know but one thing i think i know is that you always need to have a compass and a guiding star and a leadership framework can really help to iron people leaders and employees to what's the most critical for them to learn in the in the future so the sonova leadership framework it consists of uh, leading self leading teams leading the system you could most probably see it and we really try to focus on um, uh, behaviors that are critical to sonova's business success but also are going to motivate all our employees and if i think of leading self there are three leadership principles in action. So we are going a bit uh, in the details. But then the first one is be a curious learner. So we, it's like an invitation, but also an expectation. And this leadership framework, when we talk about basics, uh, it is a permission, as I'm just saying, but it's also something that you're going to be assessed on at the end of, uh, of the year because uh, the leadership framework is, is now replacing our competencies. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a lot about, you know, the intrinsic motivation, a bit the coward, a bit the stick, making sure it's a, it's a balanced system. But if I just step back again from the, the leadership framework, what we really try to put at Sonova is um, learn what you are curious about but also this is what's going to make us win. So there's also things like uh, focusing on uh, customer innovation or driving, uh, excelling for continuous uh, improvement. So this mix of behaviors that are going to fuel the performance, but also create a human-centric culture. So I think some basics are really, really important. Yeah, super interesting. So. It's about creating the kind of right incentives for learning to take place and the right context for learning to take place. Super interesting. And, you know, on that subject of leadership, I'd love to throw this to you and go, how, how do you see the role of leaders and managers specifically in creating and sustaining that change? Because, you know, I think sustaining is maybe the operative word there, right? Because it's one thing to kind of start the process. It's another thing to have it take hold and be sustainable and really yeah. embed itself in the culture of the organization. Yeah, I mean, I can make it super short. So it's the people factor in the equation that Lynette shows us, uh, showed us beforehand. Um, 
No, but honestly speaking, I mean, we we heard about this. So not people plus AI, but people times AI, right? And when when we talk about people, of course, the managers um, they they play a crucial role, um, starting from the top of the organization. But from my perspective, most importantly, the the direct so first line uh, manager level, manager level, because they know their employees best, um, obviously. And I mean, to elaborate a little bit on this. We're talking a lot of a lot about technology um, these days and also today in this meeting. To me, sometimes it feels like I mean, you have a super high tech car, uh, but you just to to forget to properly fuel it uh, or charge it, um, or you're not able to drive it, um, right? So it's very important. Don't get me wrong to have this sophisticated, elaborated AI based infrastructure in place because this will help us to make database decisions, to scale our initiatives up. Um, and also to make learning accessible, but at the very end, the people, and in this case, the, the managers, they play a super crucial role. And I think we all know how they how they can do it, or we, we can read it, um, like, I mean, understanding employee objectives and aligning employee objectives to, to the overall organizational goals to really create impact, um, but also celebrating these um, small steps and small successes, et cetera. Um, I just want to give you a, 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 a very short, very brief story that I experienced just, just this week in, in a line manager workshop that we've done um, to introduce our new skill-based kind of learning management system. Um, and we had a, 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 10 people or so in the, in the group, and uh, one of the managers at, at the very beginning, he raised some concerns, so to say, because the feedback that he gets from his team as a sales manager is that they, they rarely find time for learning. I think that's a concern all of us we have experienced um, ourselves. Towards the end of the session, funny enough, he he explained how he squeezes his learning opportunities into his very packed diary um, because he is interested in it and the topic that he's working on is super important for him. And I think that's exactly our, our role as L&D professionals, of course, to to make this behavior, so to say, transparent to bring it from the unconsciousness to the consciousness and for line managers to work with the people on what, what is important for them to grow in their role or to seek the next career opportunities. And this is nothing that L&D people from a headquarter perspective or so can do, can do. This is really the responsibility for the managers. And therefore, I, I believe that, I mean, it's a super crucial role. We all know that. And it will not be done even if we have better technology in place than we than we've had a couple of years ago yeah makes perfect sense and you you alluded to that kind of delineation between human and technical skills there as well i think and i found that to be a really fascinating point both in lynette's presentation and and in the subsequent presentation as well and it got me thinking that you know so many of these kind of taxonomies like databases of skills they really start in it and in the technical disciplines um and they're appropriate there because those skills are very easily defined and, and in some cases even carry certificates, right? Like, can you code Java? Yes, no. Obviously, there's some variation there and I get a certificate if I do it. But when you talk about those human skills, they're much harder to pin down and they're much harder to make a clear assessment as to whether you have it or not, right? It exists on a spectrum. Um, so I think that's something for organizations to consider as well as they think about these skills taxonomies, like are the methodologies that probably started with technical skills in mind, are they fit for purpose as we think about um, human skills actually, which which feeds into the last point actually that I wanted to cover, which is around the, the data piece. Um, you know, this question of like, do we have reliable data? Is it self-reported? Is it is it flawed? Is it biased? You know, so on and so forth. Um, David, I'd, I'd love to ask you this question because you alluded to it in your opening remark. What are some of the more sophisticated ways that you've seen of cataloging skills, mm. competency, behavioral knowledge, right? Like, is there a better way than just self-reporting in your mind? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and I think you've, you've hit on a really important point there. <clears throat> As we look into that, the, you know, the, 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 the next window from, from a skills perspective, you know, with the advancement of AI and technology and how those hard skills are being, uh, you know, um, augmented, like it's curious, it's come up a few times, curiosity, problem solving, communication, collaboration. These are the skills of the future. 
And we do need to find a, a holistic way to map not only the hard skills in the organization, like Lynette, I don't like soft skills, but those people are human skills as well. Um, so re we're human, of course, is known as a recognition company, but we are very, very much a data company. So we, um, you know, we've 8 million users on the platform in aggregate terms, a recognition moment every two seconds, over a billion recognition moments on file. So all of those text instances of awards and messages um, from employees, you know, peer to peer, top down, bottom up, that, that is the data set that we've pointed the large language models at. So we have, uh, we can mine that data in lots of different ways, but we're customer zero for our own product. So we have enormous amount of our own data to crunch. Um, so we've been looking at how we apply that data to mapping our own um, skills uh, taxonomy internally. So um, doing that internally, but we've also worked with a, 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 an international consulting company that had been a customer for many, many years. So they had a huge skills repository already built, but to your point, Joe, mainly tracking technical capabilities, training levels, essentially all hard skills. And what they didn't have was a way to capture those human skills. So that's where our work human IQ team stepped in. So that's you know a, a multidisciplinary team who looked at the customer data, analyzed all those recognition messages, and then in line with their skills taxonomy, were able to develop a nine grid system for mapping performance and potential. So what the customer ended up with was a really new and nuanced view of their workforce, which you know had really clear and actionable data points around strengths and weaknesses and opportunity for growth. So you can apply that to the existing data and competence in the, in the company, but also to the future in terms of new projects, new skills, new initiatives that are gonna come on online in the next um, you know, 12, 24 months, and you can look and see how future ready your, your business is. So, so, so the potential of recognition at scale from a data perspective and what tells us about our human intelligence is, uh, is a really exciting development for us. Yeah, fascinating. And you know, I know we're at time, um, but I'd, I'd love to get, if we have a moment, Jasmine and Inga, your perspective on that as well, because I think it's such an interesting idea, this delineation of like the, the hard technical skills and human skills. Do, do, do you, and feel free to chime in, do you see a distinction in how you, you know, both measure and, and drive development of those skills? Ingo, you want to get started? Happy to, happy to build on what you say as, as you want to. So um, I, I, I can I can get started. So 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 Sonova, if if you think you know we are a leading provider in hearing care solutions, so the technical aspect is is critical when it comes to R and D to production, even in sales. So this is this is key. So for me, it's an end. Right. And uh, again, with the new leadership principles, we are putting those power skills. For me, they are they are more than soft skills or human skills. They are power skills uh, back into the into the equation and, and to make it super concrete and put again the focus on those power skills for every employee we're asking in the development plans that are going to get kick started in june to put one uh, power skill in focus beyond some additional technical skills so we're providing uh, some specific to elevate uh, that that importance yeah, maybe maybe the the one thing that that I could add, Joe. Um, I mean, for, for the for the technical skills, I think historically maybe they are a little bit easier to measure, right? Because you can easily so if a person is able to uh, to to work on a machine or to re repair products in a proper way, you give them training. You measure if they are uh, if the training was effective. You see failure rates. To work through work so to say it's rather easy i would say with regards to the human skills um from my perspective what, what is what is key let's say to to really tailor them to the work environment that the people are involved in so if we talk about I don't know, communication or cooperation as a human skill for me as a as a head of L and D. This would mean something completely different as for one customer service specialist, also. And I think in order to, uh, to to measure, to coach, to give feedback, it's important to do this double click on, in this case, cooperation or communication skills, 
and define what, what this actually means for a very specific role and how we can, in the best case, match this then against, I don't know, customer complaint, rate, complaint rates or customer feedback rates, et cetera, because then at the very end, it's they become a little bit harder. I mean, they are hard skills, so to say, yeah. Um, but this, this aspect of being specific and making this applicable and relevant for, for dedicated roles, this is, this is key from my perspective. And we also we are just starting starting with this, so we are we are not there yet. Um, so quite curious to to get first first insights now over the next couple of months um, along our project that we've we've initiated. Yeah, I think that's such an important point though, and and we see that in our work as well. That you know, in defining you know whether it's behaviors or skills, actually you know it doesn't matter. They show up in different ways in different roles, right? Like if if one of the sort of soft or power skills that we have is, I don't know, integrity, for example, right? Maybe, maybe we call that a behavior, but it shows up in very different ways. If I work in sales versus customer service versus, you know, product development, right? And and there needs to be an awareness of that as we think about, you know, promoting development as well. So I think that's such a such a great point, Ingo. Um, and I'm sorry to say that I think that's where we have to leave the conversation. It feels far too short, um, but uh, we are actually already a little bit over time. Um, but you will receive all of the slides from today's presentations. Um, and also there's some downloadable material as well. Some of the research that was referenced throughout. So please check that out. And um, yeah, we look forward very much to seeing you on the next one of these. And it was such a privilege to spend this morning with you. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you to the speakers and thank you to this panel. Thanks, Joe. Take care, everyone.